hangover. Um, and secondly, everything is back to normal next week. So the, the we have, we'll be having lab, that's normal, so we have a Monday lab, turn up on Monday. We won't be looking at rock samples anymore. Um, we're going to be looking at geological maps and how we interpret them, how we draw them, how we build stories from them. Um, so it'll be pen and pencil and paper and some maps. <laughs> but today, um, today's lecture is going to be on volcanoes. So we're moving away from our different rock types from our deformation now. Um, we're going to focus for the next two lectures on volcanoes. Obviously form a massive um, part of the landscape of the South Pacific, being near the Ring of Fire. So when we talk about the term volcano, I'm sure you know what I'm referring to. But it's essentially a hill or a mountain or a surface feature that is built up from the products of a so-called lava or other pyroclastic material on the Earth's surface. And what they essentially do, they're a, a conduit, so they transfer material from the mantle to the Earth's surface. That's essentially what volcanoes do. So the stuff we put in comes from the mantle, the stuff we push out includes lava, it includes pyroclastic materials, so the stuff that's thrown into the air, and also it includes gases and water. So down there deep in the earth, we also have gases and water, so it's quite important um, for the atmosphere, essentially. And there are numerous reasons why we like to study volcanoes. One, they're exciting. Um, we've literally got, I don't know, five fountains of molten rock being erupted on the earth. People have been fascinated them for, for, for centuries, for thousands of years. Also, a lot of minerals that we find today, we use today, diamonds, we wouldn't have diamonds if we didn't have volcanoes. Um, they're essentially, they allow us to look inside the earth, because what they're doing is transporting material from inside the earth to the surface. So as a geologist, we can use those materials to tell us what's down there. And if you speak to Neil, um, he's doing his masters at the moment on um, some mantle xenoliths. So remember, a xenolith is a foreign rock trapped in another igneous rock. Um, the island of Koro, which you may be familiar with, it lies between here and Grand Malibu, is an extinct volcano, and it's built up of basaltic material and pyroclastic material, and in those basalts, you get chunks of mantle that were ripped off the side of the mantle when that mantle came to the surface and erupted. And you see perfect greens of olivine-rich peridotites, and that, by studying those, you can tell um, what the mantle is doing at that time, what mantle processes. As I said, they're connected to the Earth's atmosphere and hydrosphere, they release gases, they release water. Volcanoes are a very important contributor for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There have been periods in the past where CO2 levels have been way higher than today, and one of the reasons for that in some instances we think is just huge amounts of volcanic um, activity on Earth. And obviously in some areas, we like as humans we like to live near volcanoes. One, because um, the soil is incredibly fertile. All of that stuff that comes out of volcanoes tends to produce very, very fertile soil with a lot of important elements in it for growing plants. And so, yeah, the fruit, the vegetable, all the crops growing near volcanoes are excellent, they grow quickly, etc., etc. But on the flip side, volcanoes are hazardous to humans in very, in very um, circumstances. And as I said at the beginning, they're very, very important um, sources of mineral deposits. Any um, volcano will have obviously a magma chamber underneath, and all that water um, running through uh, cracks in the earth and pores in the earth has a lot of dissolved minerals in it because it's hot. If that cools or the pressure drops, um, you can precipitate those minerals and we mine a lot of those minerals. So, this is just our lecture outline. So, first, I'm just going to talk about um, the plumbing system, if you like, of volcanoes, what they look like what happens in a volcano. I'm going to talk about the stuff that comes out of volcanoes, what it looks like, what sort of rocks it forms. And I'm going to talk about different types of volcanoes, different landforms, and resulting from different types of volcanoes. And I've put a few pictures up here just to talk about human fascination with volcanoes for a long time. Um, imagine before the days of scientific advances, living somewhere with an active volcano, like trying to understand that. So what people do is they incorporate it in religions and mythology, and there are lots and lots of ancient myths about volcanoes. My favourite, I think, is um, 
from New Zealand, so Ra Mokro, who's um, the god of earthquakes, volcanoes, and seasons. And the myth said his mum was the um, goddess of the land, and his dad was the god of the sky, I think, and they had an argument. So, yeah, she was turned down into the earth, and so he was buried into the earth. And whenever he moves, we get a volcano and an earthquake. And there are several, I mean, Vulcan is the obvious one, that's why we call them volcanoes. This is the Roman god of fire. Um, lived inside a volcano. Pele in Hawaii was a goddess of the tree. Anyway, so this is a very um, simplified diagram of one type of volcanoes, volcano. There are many different shapes of volcano, but this is just an example of one volcano here. So we've got a nice mountain at the surface, which is made up of lots and lots of layers, and each one of those layers represents different um, eruptions. So it will contain the lava, Ash, pyroclastic material. And it all starts down here. We've got magma droplets swarming down here in the mantle. They're less dense than the surrounding crust, they're liquid. So they rise up through pore spaces and fractures very slowly in the Earth's crust. Eventually, those droplets will come together in what we call a magma chamber, so a larger um, body of molten rock. And then the magma. Rises up, rises up, takes advantage of cracks in the crust. It's still trying to rise, it's still trying to rise. It might form dikes. If this was to call cool out, it would form a nice little dike, like we saw in the field. But it pushes between sedimentary layers. If that was to cool and we saw it on the earth's surface, we'd call that a sill. We might have smaller boutons up here in the crust. But in a volcano, what happens is some of that magma reaches the surface. And either in the center of the mountain, this volcano, or on the sides of the volcano, you can have side vents on the volcano, side vent here, and so you have your main volcano, central vent in the middle usually, and so that's where the lava comes out, that's where the pyroclastic material comes out, sometimes it comes out the side, in a side vent, and all of the material that comes out um, will build up to form that volcano, that mountain. And the shape of the volcano, they come in many different shapes and sizes, and this is a really Broad, what we call a shield volcano. So it has much steeper sides, it's what we call a strata volcano. And the landforms produce the types of eruption that happen all depend on mainly the composition of the magma that's coming out. So, and also the gas content, that's really important. If you have magma with a lot of gas in it, then you'll have very explosive eruptions and you'll have different material coming out that will be fragmented. Basically, if we have polar magmas that are high in silica, high in gas, that's when we get our really explosive uh, eruptions. That's when we tend to get steeper sided volcanoes. But I'll go through those um, one by one. Degree. And this term viscous, I've talked about it before, it's a really important term. Um, so, viscosity is essentially the resistance of a liquid to flow. So, imagine having um, a slope and pouring down water. And then next to it, pouring down, I don't know, treacle or golden syrup, then it's going to um, flow a lot more slowly than the water down the slope, and that's because of its viscosity. Water has a low viscosity, treacle has a higher viscosity. So that's what I mean when I talk about viscosity. So, yeah, the type of lava is very important in dictating what style of eruption we have and what shape of volcano. Um, if we have for the first type, we have three main types of lava, so basaltic, andesitic, and rhyolitic. So if it's basaltic, you should remember this as a mafic composition. It's low in silica, high in um, magnesium and iron, and it's a very, very hot magma. But it has a very, very low viscosity, so it, um, it's very, very fluid. This is the most common type of lava in the earth. This is what at mid ocean ridges, which make up the ocean floor and um, um, produce ocean crust. And so 70% of the Earth's ocean range, all of the ocean floor is uh, covered with stuff that originated from basaltic lava. Um, but because it's so fluid, um, it can travel quite far because it spreads out as soon as it comes out of the volcano. So the volcanoes it produces tend to have very um, generally dipping sides because that magma can travel quite far. Sometimes even hundreds of kilometers. It can also travel quite fast. So they have recorded 
lava flows up to 150 kilometers an hour, but more typically we're talking a few uh, centimeters um, per second, or not even that sometimes. And they produce these really, really nice, spectacular red lavas. Um, the other lavas, like I said, they're very, very, very hot. But because they're quite fluid, they run out quite quickly of the volcanoes. So they don't build up in the central vent, so we don't really have explosive eruption. The material is allowed to come out freely. It doesn't build up in that central vent where gases and magma can pile up behind it. So we don't really have explosive eruptions here. And if you want to read about some crazy people, there are a lot of crazy people who study volcanoes. Um, there was a Russian couple, I'm not sure if yeah, there were two scientists who sailed down a basaltic lava flow on a piece of solidified lava and to get temperature measurements and gas readings um, from that lava flow. So they measured the temperature of the lava flow quite a way down the slope, it's eight, at 800 degrees, and when it came out, it would be this temperature, so it's 800 degrees, and actually the raft of lava they were um, sitting on was at a temperature above 300 degrees, and they had asbestos boots, but even with asbestos boots, they had to keep on standing on one foot because it was getting too hot. They were crazy, this is in the 30s, um, yeah, 1938, I think, but so they're just crazy. But a lot of temperature information before we had specialists came from crazy before that stuff about. So these are really, really hot lavas. The type of lava we see depends on its temperature mainly. And so when it's very, very hot, so quite close to the source usually, um, what happens is the skin of the lava, if you like, the bit in contact with the air will solidify, forming a very thin skin. And then the lava beneath it on moving, and so it, if you like, it folds that skin as it moves, and it forms this really, really nice rope texture. Um, and how we know we think of things rope like in Hawaii, um, and yeah, you get these really, really nice forms of lava. However, when it's slightly cooler, so further away from the vent, what happens is it tends to break up into blocks as it flows. So you have this lava flow, and on the top and the front, um, it solidifies and it breaks into blocks as that lava moves. So it's like a conveyor belt. So you have lava, molten rock in the middle moving along and it's carrying this raft of blocks over the top. And it keeps on moving like that. And we call that path. Um, and it's actually really hazardous. If you've never been hiking on a volcano that's been producing art, so it's now solidified. I did it in Mount Etna in Sicily and I went through one pair of hiking boots in four days um, because it's just very, very sharp. It hasn't been eroded. Um, and it's actually really hazardous to walk on. And you, as I said in the previous lecture, that's how you can remember it. Remember the pain of walking over ancient half um, That's how you remember the thing. And actually, I spent two days this week at the Rocky Rocky, looking at the Rocky Rocky volcano, and um, there's some really nice ancient half running down some of those mountains. And you can see the blocks of the material. And this is, this is where I came from. Very well, this is Mount Etna in Sicily, where I said I went on holiday. This was one of my holidays now. And this is an ancient art group. The lava will come out on the side of it and it's thrown down the hill. You can't really see, but there's some really nice blocks in there and the lava. And obviously, if the lava comes out on the sea floor, we've all seen pillow lavas, and something different tends to happen. So, and the basalt lava that comes out on the sea floor, the outside is in contact with the water. Remember, basalt is about 1,000 to 1,200 degrees C. Sea water is less than 30. Um, so there's a much, a huge temperature contrast. So the outside of the lava would congeal. And the whole thing sort of inflates like a balloon, if you like. And as it moves, um, it's like squeezing toothpaste, imagine that, um, really runny toothpaste. But as it moves, the lava pushes this um, solidified outside. Sometimes it goes through. And then it will produce another pillow lava, and then the magma inside will burst through and produce another pillow lava. And you have these big round structures on the sea floor. This is when lava comes in contact with water. So our ocean crust is covered in water. So the next type of lava we call andesitic. Um, so <coughs> this is intermediate in composition, it has slightly higher silica content, or but shouldn't have a less than sign. 
Um, also, that should say 1,000 degrees C, sorry, I'm from England, so it's fixed. So it's between 800 and 1,000 degrees C, so it's slightly cooler than our basaltic lava. If this was to cool underground, we could get a diorite. That's what we call it when we have cool springs. But if it cools on the surface, we call it andesite. And it's named after the Andes Mountains in South America. Because this is very typical of convergent plate boundaries, so either oceanic and oceanic crust meeting, or continental crust and oceanic crust subducting underneath it. Um, and the reason it's more common in these plate boundaries is because remember, to go from basalt to andesite, you need to have some magmatic differentiation. And so this magma travels quite far from the crust, it gets contaminated by other bits of crust. And you get those crystals setting out the bottom, producing the magma. But anyway, so this is more, more viscous than basalt. Viscosity is related to the silica content. So the more silica we have in our magma, the stickier it is. And so we tend to get much more explosive eruptions because that magma, that magma finds it harder to flow out of that central vent, so it tends to build, build up in the center of the volcano and gas. The magma behind it builds up over time um, and the pressure to perform um, an eruptive, uh, explosive eruption. And so we get a lot more pyroclastic material because with, it, with that explosion, we get rocks from the side of the volcano being broken up and thrown into the air. Because the gas is being released, a lot of lava is thrown into the air. We get lots of volcanic ash, um, volcanic bombs, which I'll come on to in a second. So a lot more pyroclastic. And this is a really nice example of a volcano that produces intermediate and felsic lavas, um, so andesites and rhyolites. This is Mount St. Helens in the uh, northwest USA. That's what it looked like before 1980. And then there was a huge eruption in 1980, which essentially blew the top of the mountain, so that's what it looks like now. So that's what we're, when we're talking about explosive eruptions, that's what we're talking about. We're not just talking like a puff of smoke. Some of these volcanoes are incredible. So all of that material that made up that mountain was thrown into the air um, when that mountain erupted. I don't know if you can see here, but in the centre of Mount St. Helens now, there's a new little dome starting to form. That's just since 1980. And this is an predominantly andesitic volcano. And you can see that the sides of the volcano are all steeper as well. There's another type of eruption um, called a phreatic eruption, and this is where we have magma rising through the crust and it meets water, so either groundwater or rivers or lakes or the sea, and that's when we get very, very, very explosive eruptions, particularly if there's a lot of gas in that magma. Andesite has way more gas in it than basalt, um, and the gas can't escape as quickly because it's more viscous. <coughs> And yeah, we have a lot of gas released because it's charged with gas and these explosive eruptions when that magma comes in contact with seawater or rivers and lakes throws lots and lots of fragments into the air. And a really famous example of a phreatic eruption is the Krakatoa eruption which happened in 1883. So this is Indonesia. So if you remember your plate tectonics practical, you looked at Sumatra, which is part of Indonesia. It's on a big subduction zone. A chain of volcanoes running above that subduction zone. This is the island of Krakatoa. The top photograph shows what um, Krakatoa looked like before 1883, and this is what it looked like after 1883. So, magma cave erupted underneath the seafloor, uh, onto the seafloor, and we had this incredibly explosive eruption, so much that you it's probably the loudest sound ever witnessed in recorded history. So the sound of the eruption was found, uh, uh, was geared up to 5,000 kilometers away, um, and 40,000 people were killed, mainly from the tsunamis that followed the volcanic eruption. Um, so it's quite a huge eruption. So the third type of lava that we encounter in volcanoes, this tends to form, because this needs a lot of uh, magmatic differentiation to form, so they tend to um, occur where we have very thick crust, so the magma has travelled a much, much further distance before it gets to the surface, or a lot more chances to get differentiated. 
um, and also to incorporate parts of the crust. And especially if you have continental crust that it's traveling through, um, then it'll get a lot of silica-rich material as it travels through the crust. And you end up with this incredibly viscous, um, low, high silica, um, lowish temperature, so 600 to 800 degrees C. And we call these felsic matters, and the lava type is rhyolitic. So rhyolite is the name of the rock produced from a rhyolitic lava. And they move incredibly slowly, so 10 times slower than basalt. That would be like, I don't know, pouring you know, very thick treacle down your slope rather than water. Um, and because they move so slowly, their minerals will sometimes align as they fall, and you get this really nice um, flow bandwidth in the rocks that are produced. But these produce incredibly explosive eruptions um, because they contain a lot of gas and water. Felsic magmas contain a lot of gas and water, and they're incredibly, incredibly viscous. So they build up. <clears throat> and what tends to happen is imagine, I don't know, some really dried up toothpaste and you squeeze it. So that's what happens in a, a rhyolitic volcano. Instead of the lava coming out and flowing down the sides or producing nice fountains like basalt volcanoes do, it just sort of pushes out of the ground very, very slowly, like squeezing that toothpaste that's dried up out of the ground. Um, and a lot of gas can build up behind that plug of volcanic material. Pressure build up, builds up and the volcano erupts. And a really nice example of a rhyolitic, predominantly rhyolitic volcanic system is in uh, Yellowstone National Park in the United States. So this is a cross section of what the crust might look like. So it overlies a massive hotspot. So remember those mantle plumes that rise up through the mantle, um, causing a lot of heat underneath the Earth's crust. You get a melting of the mantle. Those melts rise up and they might collect a form of basaltic magma chamber. As they go through the crust, they get differentiated. They melt parts of the continental crust. Fractional crystallization removes the basic um, minerals. And you might end up with a rhyolitic magma chamber that feeds various eruptions of the surface. Now, Yellowstone, we might have seen some scaremongering in documentaries about this. And that's because this will, if this ever blows, it will produce an incredibly huge eruption that could wipe out most of the USA. Some people say that's a good thing, I don't know. But um, there's evidence in the, in the surrounding area of these huge, huge eruptions. Um, so there was one, 2.1, 1.3, 1.64 million years ago in Yellowstone itself. So it's erupted several times. You could argue, some people argue, with due for a new one, which roughly, um, I don't know, maybe 800,000 years, more or less. Um, what, every 700,000 years? Um, and we see volcanic ash from this eruption, eruptions in the past, sorry, reaching, far reaching in the USA, so thousands of kilometers. So the fact that it's on a hot spot and the plates are moving in this direction also means that elsewhere in the States we see lots and lots of different um, volcanic centers that are now extinct because the, hot, the plates are moving from a hot spot. But this is where Yellowstone is. It's a huge, huge volcano, and yeah, there have been various documentaries saying what would happen if it blows, um, it could blow in time, and yeah, it would be incredibly, incredibly destructive. So I've already talked to you a little bit when we did igneous rocks about uh, igneous textures. So textures of volcanic rocks, and just to remind you, a lot of these um, volcanic products um, will have different textures depending on the processes that form them. So we often get vesicles. I've mentioned a lot of well, magma often has a lot of gas. It's like that Coke bottle. When the, the lid's on and it's factory sealed, um, that Coke won't have any bubbles that you can see because they're in solution, they're under pressure. You remove the pressure, the bubbles come out. It's the same with magma. Um, so when it's underneath the ground, it has a lot of dissolved gas in it. As it's depressurized when it erupts, the air comes out of solution, the gases come out of solution, and if the um, material solidifies before the, air, the gas can escape, you see bubbles in the rock. So something like this. And you call those these bubbles. And obviously, sometimes the lava falls so quickly you don't see any crystals, even in the microscope, and that's our volcanic glass. And if you have broken up pieces of material, we call that pyroclastic material, and that was 
grown up with it. So I'll talk to you a bit about different lava types. So the, the stuff that ejected and thrown out of the volcano into the air, all, all that pyroclastic material, pyro means fire, plastic means made up of uh, fragments. Um, there are lots of different terms, volcanic ejector, stuff that's been ejected out of the volcano. Tetra is a very generic term used for everything, that, every part, every type of pyroclastic material. It can contain bits of pumice, bits of igneous rock, bits of rock that made up the side of the volcano. But we classify it usually according to its size. So volcanic ash is very, very fine particles, so less than two millimeters, and that's what produces these huge, huge clouds. Volcanic ash clouds here yeah. um, above the volcanoes. If they're slightly bigger, the fragments, so two to sixty-four millimeters, we call them the pinny. That's what they might look like, little fragments of scoria there. And that means little stones in Latin. And then anything bigger, we either call it a rock or a bomb. Um, a bomb, volcanic bomb is where the material that was thrown out was initially molten, so it was lava, and then it solidified and it if you throw out an actual solid chunk of rock that was part of the volcano before the eruption and it's thrown into the air as a solid, we call it a rock, but they're just in specific terms. And I mean, these things can be huge. You've seen like, blocks or bombs the size of houses being thrown 50 kilometers or something because of the force of the eruption. Um, but yeah, that's what the material is made from. And it tends to be blown wherever the wind direction is. Obviously, the material thrown out tends to be blown in that direction. The coarser stuff, so the blocks and the bombs, tends to settle out on the ground near the volcano because it's heavier and it's harder for it to stay in the air, especially after the eruption has continued. And then we move away from the eruption and we get finer and finer material because the ash can travel, can travel quite far, long distances in the air, particularly if it's windy. And if it actually reaches above, um, way very high into the um, atmosphere, then it can be transported huge, huge distances around the Earth. Um, and there's, so in the 17th century, 18th century, um, there was a famous painter in the UK called Turner, and all of his paintings had these very red, weird coloured skies in them, and people actually think that now is because there was this massive eruption in Indonesia, um, Tambora, um, and it transported volcanic ash around the globe, and it caused these very, very peculiar sky colours. Um, whenever you have more dust in the atmosphere, you get redder skies um, around sunset. So that's what they think. That's why they think two of the skies have a high red But anyway, this ash can actually travel quite long distances, which is useful for us um, because ash layers are very good for dating, using our radiometric dating. So if we have rocks from the middle of the ocean and we have some ash in it, we can date it and then date the rest of the rock. This, um, I hate this volcano because it's got me going on holiday. But in 2010, I think it was, yeah, 2010, it says there, um, on Iceland, which I told you is a volcanic um, country in the north of the Atlantic, there was an ice cap called, I'm waiting for this, Eyjafjallajökull. So that's Icelandic. So that ice cap and the ice um, layer was named that, was a glacier. And there was a volcanic eruption underneath the ice. So as the magma hit the ice, there was quite an explosive eruption of hot gas and um, ash produced by the, the cool and the hot thing meeting. There's a very big ash cloud and looking down at the North Pole, the ash was transported quite long distances and all flights were blocked. That's why I couldn't go on holiday because they thought that the tiny uh, volcanic ash, the glass, I guess, so the very, um, uh, shards of glass from the volcano would go into the air to, uh, engines and under the heat of the engine of the turbines they would melt, which would cause obviously huge problems for a thing. Um, so yeah, I think that's And obviously all this material, once it's thrown into the air, will eventually settle down on the Earth's surface. This is another holiday snap from Mount Etna in Sicily and it produces often these really eerie looking landscapes covered in volcanic ash and then some of these blocks and bombs and lots of lapilli as well. Um, this is actually on the volcano, so it's quite close to the source. That's why we can see such large blocks. 
And obviously over time it starts to get buried um, and it can get compacted and cemented and to form a rock. And we call it a tuff if it's predominantly time-grained, a volcanic tuff. <coughs> and sometimes you don't even need to bury and compact it and cement it to produce rock because if that ash is incredibly hot when it lands, it actually welds together. We call that a welding tuff or a living grain. And obviously if it's got a lot of coarse grain material in it, it tends to be angular, but it hasn't been abraded much. We call that a volcanic breaker or another one. So another type of um, pyroclastic sort of process or a feature is called pyroclastic flow. And this is when um, you have a volcano, some of the ash and um, pyroclastic debris is flown high into the air. Sometimes if it um, rolls down the side of the volcano, um, it's very, very dense because it has all this volcanic ash and the material, it can be incredibly hot and it transports itself under gravity down the side of the volcano at huge speeds. We're talking hundreds of kilometers an hour. Um, very hot often, and it's a mixture of yeah, dust, rocks, ash, and these are deadly, as you can imagine. And this is a lovely picture of a scientist trying to run away from the planet that's a flow. And that has London in 1991 in Japan. Um, in fact, there's a crazy couple, another crazy volcanologist couple that you should look up, up on YouTube, look up on the web. Um, they're called Maurice and Katja Kraft, and they were Swiss volcanologists, and they were absolutely obsessed with volcanoes. Um, they used to go incredibly close to volcanoes with their giant spacesuits. Their dream was to build a boat to sail down lava flows. Um, they died in that pipe, so that pyroclastic fire. Um, the pyroclastic cloud killed them because that basically they knew that this was going to erupt soon. They knew it was due for an eruption, so they got up there monitoring gases, looking at ground movement. Because obviously, just before an eruption, the ground actually builds up and up and up because the magma is coming closer to the surface and the gases are pushing the land away. So you can monitor ground movement um, to see if there's going to be an eruption. And gases coming out. Um, yeah, but actually, the eruption didn't come out of the center; it came off the side. And so they were caught in the pyroclastic flow. But in terms of how they wanted to want to die, I think they're probably happy with that. <coughs> and this is another example of how deadly these things can be. So this is in 1902. There's um, a Caribbean island called Martinique, and this is Mount Kelly, Martinique, Martinique, and then a huge pyroclastic cloud formed. It rolled down the hill, and they basically they don't get blocked by anything. So hot, so fast, so dense, anything in its way is just destroyed. And um, unfortunately, there was a town in the way called Saint Pierre, and all the people in the town survived. So 29,000 people were killed. And they think that it had an internal temperature of 800 degrees C. So these things are incredibly deadly and incredibly quick. Another type of volcan volcanic flow or pyroclastic flow um, is called a lake heart, which is an Indonesian word, I believe. And this is where you have all that volcanic debris, but it's mixed with water. So it flows down the side of the volcano, tends to follow river, river valleys, and it can be quite hot if that, some of that material has only just come out of the volcano, or if the water's been heated up. Um, but they can, they can form in many ways, it's a generic term. There was a really nice example in New Zealand in 2007 where Mount Volcano um, had on top of its book on the volcano, in the crater there was a lake, and the lake was dammed around all sides by tephra deposits from previous eruptions, and then actually there was a landslide that broke the banks of that lake. The water rushed out, mixed with um, all the volcanic ash and everything on the mountainside, flowed down the volcano, and you can see here are destructive little babies and houses, just destroyed everything in its path. I don't think too many people died, but some people died. And a really nice example occurred in 1985. So this is in Colombia in a place called Nevada del Ruiz. Um, this volcano here erupted. The ash and the products of the ash that eruption mixed with uh, melted snow flowed down the side of the mountain and basically destroyed everything in its path. It followed river channels. So um, a river channel here, a river channel here, a river channel there. And a 
got human settlements in Exeter Rivers because of the water supply, and uh, 25,000 people dying in the photographs, and that's what the land looks like after the lake house. The lake house can be uh, incredibly deadly. And obviously, as geologists, we're interested in the rock, so we can actually see the house, the lake house, um, in the rock record. And obviously, they're just incredibly poorly sorted mixtures of everything. They might even have trees in them. And anything they picked up on their way uh, will be incorporated in the lake house. Um, and so we get these very, very poorly sorted sediments. They're quite hard to distinguish between the types of volcanic um, debris flows up here. <coughs> so finally, I'll talk about the shapes of volcanoes and how we name the different types of volcano. They all have different magma types. Um, so the first type I'll talk about is a shield volcano. So the volcano we saw in the field trip, or we saw evidence of in the field trip, Raki Raki volcano, um, which was about 20 kilometers in diameter in its day. It would have had very gentle slopes. And then a shield volcano, so the main features are these very gentle slopes. The sides of the volcano are made up almost entirely of layers of lava from previous eruptions. And they form when you have very, very, very low viscosity lava, so like basalt. So wherever you have a predominantly basalt, you tend to get shield. So Hawaii is a really good example. Uh, most of the Hawaiian volcanoes are basaltic, so you call these really nice shields. And this is Mauna Loa, a volcano in Hawaii. Um, actually, the, high, the tallest structure, nat natural structure on Earth, is from the sea floor to its top, it's 10 kilometers high. It has a 120 kilometer wide base on the end of the sea floor, and that entire thing is built up from layers of lava from successive eruptions. That, that lava is very low viscosity, so it runs out very easily and forms these very, very gentle slopes. And an example in Fiji, apart from the Raki Raki volcano, is um, Tabuni, this elongated island in the north next to Manu Levu. That's actually an ancient elongated shield volcano. So if you go to the Tabuni, um, then you see successive basaltic lava flows um, when it erupts. It's actually one of the youngest volcanoes. So the next type is called a volcanic dome. And this is produced where you have very, very, you have a lot more silica-rich lavas, so andesites and rhyolites, and that lava can't flow out, or out very easily because of this high viscosity, so it tends to just build up in the center, and so you get this big, steep mountain built up by lava that stays around that center where it tends to. So you see here, the very, very steep side is this dome-shaped top. And lava is piled up over the central bed. So Mount St. Helens that I showed you the photos of, that's a dome, uh, dome shaped volcano. So obviously now it's had its top blown off in 1980. You can see a new dome forming in the center. This imagines the tube of toothpaste just freezing up these really, really viscous lavas. Largely pushing out of the ground and solidifying. There's a lot of gas building up in here, like the lower bed. Nice dome forming, and that's only 35 years ago. And in Fiji, an example, um, if you ever been to Kandaru, there's a mountain called Nangupale, and that's actually a dome volcano. And the last time it erupted was 1660, so it's not yet, um, not yet over in Fiji for volcanoes. How are we doing for time, I'll carry on. Um, so another type of volcano is called a syndicate. And these are really nice, these are almost like your cartoon volcanoes. When you draw a volcano with a tile, that's um, probably what you'll draw, something like this up here. Nice steep sides, central crater. And cinder uh, cone volcanoes form where there's a lot of gas in the magma. So the stuff that comes out of the magma tends to, um, the, the central bed tends to get thrown in the air. So the layers from previous eruptions tend to be all made up of pyroclastic material or chunks of lava that was thrown up into the air in fountains and then came to the ground and solidified. Uh, but yeah, they tend to be made up of volcanic debris rather than lava flows, which is where we have a lot of gas. Um, so this is a nice example here. Um, actually, if you've got any emails here, there's a, I don't know how to pronounce Anuatu in some phrase, I'm just going to say Aruba. I don't know, I think it might be Azabe or something like that. But there's an island in Vanuatu. 
fishes. I'm talking huge, huge volumes, like thousands of cubic kilometers, millions of cubic kilometers, and this is a map of the Earth um, showing I mean, all these flood basalts. They're just absolutely massive. These red blobs show um, locations on the Earth, as I put, show ancient flood basalts. You don't have them for in the rain. This is where large areas of the crust are covered in lava from these fissure eruptions. The famous example in the uh, USA called the Columbia Plateau. They produce these really nice series of layers. You can see the layers in there. Actually, they're not sedimentary, they're lava flows. As in India, the death and traps. We use the term trap um, to describe the flood basalt path. Um, the Ontong Java Plateau, which stopped um, Fiji lying on the subduction zone, so remember this stretch, where I said there was a thick piece of oceanic crust that blocked the subduction at some point, well that's the Ontong Java Plateau. That's been huge amounts of basalt for this eruption.